African leaders concluded the 37th summit of the African Union AU in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. On Sunday, the meeting took place as the continent is con- confronted with a myriad of military and political crises. AU Commission Chair Musa Faki Mohammed urged the leaders to address the continent's many conflicts and coups. Joseph Kiyoko is a Kenyan political analyst. He tells me the AU's policy of non-interference in the internal affairs of member countries presents an inherent contradiction for the body. One of the challenges in the principles of establishment of AU and even the previous body, OAU, the Organization of African Unity, is uh, the principle of non-interference in uh, state, local state politics of member states. So you find that there could be a lot of drama in uh, DRC Congo. There are problems in Senegal with the postponement of elections. There are so many conflicts in Ethiopia, Somali, crisis that is brewing up. But the principal state first is non-interference. And then the regional body, in this case, uh, East African community for the DRC Congo or the Comesa region for, again, DRC, to come into play to first attempt to resolve that problem before it being escalated to the African Union. But again, the leadership of the union's hands are tied. At the start of this current summit in Addis Ababa, the chairperson, Musa Faki Mahamad, was employing the leaders to try to do uh, their best in resolving conflicts on the continent. And how would they do it if they believe in no interference? That's an inherent contradiction uh, in terms of uh, speech and action. So you, you will find this general blanket statement, like I said, the session of hostility, but when you want to get to tangible action points or tangible things that need to be done within a certain time frame, the African Union really can't do much about it. That's the sad nature of it. Unless you find that a decision has been made maybe at the UN Security Council and then African Union has been mandated to take a lead. I want you to talk about Raila Odinga wanting to be the, the new chair of the African Union. What's your view? One is a deserving individual in terms of getting the position. You know, there are few remaining uh, African statesmen of his caliber. So him being nominated truly fills in that role. And I think this is a good candidate for the country, for the region, East African community, and also for the continent itself. Now, in order for Raila to get that job, um, does he have to be nominated or approved by President William Ruto? I'm asking this question, because depending on who you talk to, in, um, some people might think uh, oh, Raila has been a polarizing person, particularly since the last election. So does he need Ruto's approval? The position is uh, you're fronted by the government of the day. It's the Kenyan government, really. Uh, that supports your candidature. So the government of President Ruto has endorsed that decision and it will play its role in fronting Raila, the Kenyan candidate. Yes, historically, he has been a polarizing because of the election and campaigns that have been happening. But on this particular note, this is the coming together of the Kenyan leaders, putting aside their parochial national interest and fronting an individual to represent Kenya at a continental level. Joseph Kiyoko is a Kenyan political analyst. He was speaking with us from the capital, Nairobi. U.S. President Joe Biden will host Kenyan President William Ruto on May 23rd for a state visit aimed at boosting ties with a key East African ally, the White House said on Friday. Ruto will be the first African leader to receive a state visit at the White House since Biden took office in 2021. The visit comes as the Biden administration tries to focus on Africa as rivals Russia and China seek gains on the continent. Political analyst David Monda tells viewers Douglas Mpuga the invitation is a positive signal to Nairobi from Washington. In terms of Kenya being one of the U.S. allies, I think this is a very positive signal to Nairobi from Washington that the U.S. values Kenya not only as a regional partner, but an anchor state within the region. And remember, this is also commemorating 60 years of very close diplomatic relations 
between Washington and, uh, and Nairobi. It should not be lost to us. Former President Obama's uh, father came to the U.S. in that first initial block of African students in the 60s that uh, John Kennedy brought over. So there's a very interesting sort of history around that. There's the Cold War history of uh, U.S.-Kenya relations. But I think it's also an important uh, diplomatic visit because the U.S. has really been trying to reinforce its influence in, in East and Central Africa and Africa more broadly because America is not the only game in town. Africa, Kenya, they have a lot of other partners they can work with, whether it's China, whether it's Russia, whether it's uh, the European Union, whether it's Turkey. So I think the U.S., in, in terms of this visit, is really trying to consolidate its uh, traditional relationship. To what extent do you see this as a broader vision as outlined at the U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit, which emphasized the essential role of African leadership in addressing global priorities? It's important on two levels. On one level, that uh, the Biden administration is trying to show that, uh, that Africa matters, it, particularly now, this is 2024, Biden is really trying to show up a key voting constituency, you know, the African-American community. This visit is important in that light, that it shows that the U.S. is not only just talking the talk, but also walking that talk of re-engaging with Africa, really a very new way of, of equal partnership. But also, let's not forget, it's reinforcing these broader issues of uh, American foreign policy centered around human rights, democracy, and good governance. And I think Kenya is really seen as one of the models of the continent for progressive constitution, for the rule of law, for one of those countries that at least making an effort to try and, and, and consolidate democracy. What do you think Ruto's role would be, given that the East African region has issues, say, between Somalia and Somaliland and Ethiopia. There is the, the Sudan uh, neighborhood and uh, the Diara Congo and the Rwanda issues. Centrally, President Ruto's role will be really to try and place Kenya as a regional interlocutor that Kenya can actually engage diplomatically, use its uh, diplomatic infrastructure networks uh, to try and bring uh, peace within the region and ensure that uh, these conflicts do not escalate. The U.S. has condemned Saturday Rwanda's support of the armed M23 group in eastern Congo, whose rebellion has caused the displacement of hundreds of thousands of people and called on the rebel group to cease hostilities. The U.S. State Department, in a statement, strongly criticized the worsening violence caused by the actions of the Rwanda-backed U.S. and U.N.-sanctioned M23 armed group. It called on Rwanda to immediately withdraw all Rwanda Defense Force personnel from the Congo and remove its surface to air missile systems, which it said threatened civilian lives and peacekeepers. It also urged the rebels to retreat from their current positions near two urban areas in Congo's North Kivu province. This is likely to put pressure on Rwanda, whose government has repeatedly denied any links to the M23 group. Congolese President Felix Tshisekedi has accused Rwanda of destabilizing Congo by backing the rebels UN experts previously said they had solid evidence that members of Rwanda's armed forces were conducting operations there in support of the M23 group. Fighting near Goma, the capital of North Kivu province and the largest city in the region, has intensified in recent days as the rebels threatened to take over the metropolis Residents of the nearby town of Saki have been freeing fierce fighting between Congolese government groups and the group. The armed conflict has so far displaced more than one million people in eastern Congo since November, according to the aid group Masi Corps. Many M23 fighters, including Congolese Tutsis, were, more, were once members of Congo's army. The group whose leaders say they are fighting to protect local Tutsis from extremist Hutu groups such as the Democratic Forces of the Liberation of Rwanda F. Darrell, whose members were among the perpetrators of the 1994 genocide in Rwanda. 
M23 is one of more than 100 armed groups active in eastern Congo seeking a share of the region's gold and other resources as they carry out mass killings. The rebel group rose to prominence just over a decade ago when its fighters seized Gomer, which odd borders render. The lives its name from a March 23, 2009 peace deal which it accuses the Congo government of not implementing after being largely dormant for a decade. The M23 resurfaced in late 2021. The US statement urged all sides to de-escalate and to participate constructively in reaching a negotiated solution to the conflict. It is essential that all states respect each other's sovereignty and territorial integrity and hold accountable or actors for human rights abuses in the conflict in Eastern Congo, it said.